So, you want to know how to make music? Maybe learn how to make a podcast? Or how to edit audio for your videos? In this video, I'm going to show you how to use this piece of software called Ardor. Ardor started out with its first release in September of 2005. It was created by Paul Davis as the original developer, who also made the Jack Audio Connection Suite. Ardor was built around integrating this audio connection system to provide the most flexible recording software for audio. Ever since the initial release in 2005, it has evolved to be an all-around digital audio workstation for any type of audio production. Introducing a flexible plugin system, unlimited tracks and buses with hardware as the only limitation, transport and synchronization with external control devices, a video timeline, and a powerful routing system, this became one of the best tools to use on Linux. With features ranging from flexible audio slash MIDI routing to unlimited tracks and time span length for the most ambitious projects, today I'm going to show you how to use it. Starting from the basics, this is how you get around the interface of our door. When you create a new project, our door will open up with one track in the editor window titled Master. Master is where all the audio tracks created in our door will go to when they are created. The final render slash export will also come from this audio channel. On the left you see a strip with the label master. This is a mixer strip from the editor window. This is used to control the specific strip selected in the editor window. And you can control inputs, outputs, panning, and the plugin chain for the bus. On the top you will see a few buttons. The metronome button is to toggle on a metronome that will tick at the tempo the project is set at. To the right are the starts slash end markers from the session. These are used to move the playhead, which is this red thing, around the start of the session and the end of the session, depending on how big you made your tracks. To the right of those, we have a loop, a play button, another play button, a stop button, and a record button. These are all pretty self-explanatory. To the right, we see the internal, follow edits, and auto return. These control the backend audio of our door, which is typically Jack, but can utilize other backends such as Elsa or Asia for Windows. The windows to the right of these are time span indicators and meter measurements. These will tell you where the playhead is in the project window. Last, all the way in the right, is the editor, mixer, and preferences buttons. These switch in between windows, which is an intuitive feature of this DAW. This is based around our door's philosophy of having a workflow in a singular screen space. Although you can pop these out into separate windows by detaching them in case you have more than one monitor to utilize. Below these main buttons, we have more buttons. This tab labeled slide sets how you want the Ardor interface to interact with the grid, either as a slide, a ripple, or a lock. Now, the grid's main purpose is to keep rhythm to the main tempo, but Ardor isn't restricted to a lock grid. Ardor's track interface follows a linear style for audio and MIDI, where you can utilize the grid with these settings. There is slide, ripple, and lock. Slide means that dragging a selection is in a linear fashion. Ripple is similar to slide, except it can't be dragged into a separate track. Lock keeps the track in the same place horizontally, except you can drag to a separate track. You can choose these functions depending on what you want to do with the selector region. To write this tab, we have a few buttons. Smart enables range functions to grab mode. Grab mode is a mode that will set your cursor to grab regions and move them, or right-click them and select different options. Range mode is used to select ranges in the timeline. Cut mode is used to make cuts in the selected clip in the region. Stretch mode is used to stretch out region selections. Audition mode is used to listen to selected regions in the timeline. Draw mode and internal edit mode are mainly to be used with automation or MIDI. Draw draws and edits gain slash node slash automation points while internal edit mode can only edit these and move them around. These buttons control the zoom on the entire session. You can either zoom out 
or you zoom in. Or you can put the entire session into the entire window. This is where zoom focus will be on. It'll be based either around the left, the right, the center, the playhead, the mouse, or the edit point in the project. Here, it's the number of visible tracks. If it's a star, that means that it will have all of them. This will shrink tracks in your project or expand tracks in your project. Now, the last three tabs in this section controls how clips and regions react on the timeline. The first one has magnetic, which is set automatically. And then there's grid and no grid. How these three functions work is magnetic will allow you to move around the clips in the timeline to wherever you want to. But if you get near a grid point, it will snap on there. Grid restricts it so that you can only go within the grid margins. No grid has no guidelines, but you can still see the grid. But you can also move the clips around in a linear fashion. Over here, beats divided by four is how you want the grid to look. If you want to just beats, which is just each grid line in the tempo, then it'll be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But if you want it to be divided to beats divided by two, it'll be eight grid marks per a beat. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Although this can change depending on how you write your music. I tend to leave it at beats divided by four, just so I can move around drum samples. Now these three tabs are used to decide where you want to copy and paste the clips in the timeline, either at the playhead, where the marker is, or where the mouse is. And on the left side of the screen, we have the editor mixer strip. This strip shows up when you select a track on the timeline. This is the same on the mixer interface of our door as it is here. The top controls audio slash MIDI inputs. Below, the empty space controls what plugins are added into a track and the order they follow. And below that controls the fader volume, panning, and output of the track. I'll do a more in-depth tutorial about routing and mixing in the future. The bottom of the main window controls the view of the timeline. You can stretch and shrink this white box to control which strips are visible in the window. Lastly, we have the tracks and markers. The mirror marker sets the meter that the grid will be in the project. The tempo marker sets the tempo of the project at that point. This allows for the projects to have different tempos at different parts of the project. The range and loop slash punch range markers are used to set ranges in the timeline. CD and location markers are used to set locations in the project to organize what each section is and label it. On top of these markers, there is the time code and beats slash bars spaces. It shows you the time code of the playhead and the meter it is at. On the very top right of the window, we have the general information of the audio engine of the project and the time. The information mainly tells you how much you can record and how hard your CPU is working to play back the project. That is pretty much the interface that you are provided with in Ardor 5. While the layout is a bit strange when compared to traditional DAWs, the workflow is designed to either be worked on with a single window or multiple windows. Hopefully this video has helped make the interface look a little less intimidating and motivate you to get started to working on your own creations in Ardor. In the next video, I'll be looking over how to add tracks, arrange them, use midis, and plugins on them.